We're going to start with Bill's story. Chapter one, Bill's story. Who the hell's Bill? Bill right. Bill's uh, one of the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous. They put his story in here because he had exhibited this profound change that they're going to describe in the in the book. But as we look at his story closely, we'll see that while Bill was no different than you and me. Okay? So War fever ran high in the New England town to which we knew young officers from Plattsburgh were assigned. We were flat, flattered when the first citizens took us to their homes, making us feel heroic. Here was love, applause, war, moments sublime with intervals hilarious. I was part of life at last, and in the midst of the excitement, I discovered liquor. I forgot the strong warnings and the prejudices of my people concerning drink. In time, we sailed for over there. This is WW1. I was very lonely and again turned to alcohol. We landed in England. I visited Winchester Cathedral. Much moved, I wandered outside. My attention was caught by a doggerel. That's a nonsense verse on an old tombstone. Here lies a Hampshire grenadier who caught his death drinking cold, small beer. A good soldier is ne'er forgot whether he dieth by musket or by pot. Ominous warning, which I failed to heed. Um, just a second. When I read this, I thought, pass. I mean, it, it makes no sense if you're going to read it from the surface, from the circumstances of Bill's life. I was, I was not in the military. I did not go to war. I don't have these experiences. But if we look at the emotional landscape, we'll start to identify. So just to... Like, here's a line. Making us feel heroic. Okay? He joins the army. They're assigned. He shows up in town. Citizens took us to their homes, making us feel heroic. In the world of, of psychology, psychiatry, that's called external referral. Okay? You can't make me feel anyway. The way I feel is determined by what I think. But Bill's orientation is... They made me feel heroic. They made me feel heroic. Now, on the surface of this, if this is a normal person, it wouldn't be a big deal. But when it's alcoholism, it's, it's, it's really important to understand. Here was love applause. Here was acceptance. That was the first drug I was conscious of chasing as a child, was approval. Of course it's normal to want love and acceptance. Of course it's normal. But if you're an alcoholic, your desire for that and what will satisfy that is much greater than a normal person. Anything we decide we need to be okay, we need, like they say, an alcoholic can use up a six-month supply of anything in a week. You know, if it works, I'm on. So, here was love, applause, war, moments sublime with intervals hilarious. If you switched that for me and said, here was drug, sex, and rock and roll, I'm on board. I get it. Because that was, that was my vehicle. It wasn't the war. I got into the music business. I had some success. And I'm going, here it is. Money, power, prestige. Beautiful. I was part of life at last. I finally found a place I fit. I finally found a place where I was okay. And then in the midst of all that, I discovered alcohol. My story was a little different. <coughs> in the midst of being restless, irritable, and, <coughs> and nuts... As a kid, it took me about 15 years to find alcohol. But when I found it, I recognized it for what it was, a solution. So, forgot the warnings and prejudices of my people concerning drink. Um, I didn't have warnings, but I had my dad's example. My dad was a big uh, executive in the construction business. He had, he had an international reputation, incredibly competent man, um, and he was a drunk. And I don't know about you guys growing up, but growing up with my dad, it was like, that's God. I mean, that's all I need to know right there. That guy, anytime I had a question, he had an answer. Anytime something was broken, he knew how to fix it. I mean, he was just the rock. He was the man. And then I watched him get torn up by alcohol and percodent. <laughs> Got a little percodent habit going there, too. And he would go about every 18 months, the last several years he drank, into the hospital for his nerves. 
for his nerves. And they'd calm him down, you know, and, and uh, he'd get out, and then his nerves would become problematic again. And uh, so I had an example. This guy, I'm 13 now, and uh, I come in from out, out what I was out, whatever, I was out. And I come home late at night, I'm watching TV, and I hear this noise. I'm in the, I'm in the kitchen, and there's my dad on all fours looking for his bottle that he hid in the kitchen. And he had him hid it ever, hidden everywhere. It was kind of silly because he drank openly, but he hid his supply. And uh, we had a liquor cabinet. It was cool for a kid growing up in an alcoholic home. We had a liquor cabinet with a combination lock on it. But he put the hasp on with the screws on the outside. So if you forgot the combination, you could just unscrew it and open it up, which is how I drank. <clears throat> anyway, um, so I didn't have the warnings, but I had the example. And this guy that was my god was reduced to, reduced to crawling out of fours. I remember, I remember this vividly. He was in his pajamas sitting at the kitchen table with a glass of scotch. And I was sitting there going, God, Dad, can't you see what this is doing to you? And he just started bawling. And he just started crying. And I can't do anything about it, son. And it was just devastating for me. So I had example of what I was up against. And like a lot of people in the room, probably, you know, when I started drinking, I just I just made a decision. Well, I won't be like my dad, you know, and if it gets to be a problem, I'll do something about it. And then I would take off on my little drinking roller coaster and I'd think, hey, this is getting a little out of hand. And I'd stop drinking. And I just smoked dope. And then I'd smoke dope and then I'd start getting out of hand. I'd say, hey, getting a little strung out. You can't think straight. I got to quit doing this pot. I'll just drink a little bit. You know, I went back and forth like that for a number of years. And it was just like, you know, my my uh, my covenant to myself was I'll never be like my dad. And I wasn't. I was much worse than my dad ever was. I was much worse. My dad, much worse. Just leave it at that. The details will come out later. But so we make this promise to ourselves that it's impossible for us to keep. So. The effect of alcohol. I was part of life at last. In the midst, I discovered alcohol. The effect. So now, we get down to the bottom of that first page. 22, a veteran of foreign wars. I went home at last. I fancied myself a leader, for had not the men of my battery given me a special token of appreciation. My talent for leadership, I imagine, would place me at the head of vast enterprises, which I would manage with the utmost assurance. Now, if you look at that at its face value, you go, well, not bad. The guy's, you know, a young man. He's confident. He's got goals. And you think, yeah, that's nice. He's got a plan. But when you put it in the context of alcoholism, read it again. I went home at last. I fancied, I imagined, I dreamed myself a leader. My talent for leadership, I imagined, I fantasized, would place me at the head of vast enterprises, which I would manage with the utmost of assurance. Bill does not see himself as a man among many. He sees himself as the man. And he's like us. You know, if you're going to do something, I'd like to be the best. If I can't be the best, I'd like to be the worst. But if I can't be the best, I probably won't even play. I probably won't even participate. Now, none of this, remember this little external referral thing about applause and acceptance. None of this would be bad if Bill was a normal guy. But you take this and pour alcohol on it, and you get what we're going to read about. I took a night law course and obtained employment as an investigator for a surety company. The drive for success was on. I'd prove to the world I was important. Here it's starting to show up. I need to know from you that I'm okay. I need to know from you that I'm the man that I'm a success because all my success and my image, my picture of me is going to be based on what you all are feeding back to me because I have no internal compass. So I proved to the world I was important. My work took me about Wall Street and little by little I became interested in the market. Many people lost money, but some became very rich. Why not I? So I studied economics and business as well as law potential alcoholic that I was, I nearly failed my law course. 
At one of the finals, I was too drunk to think or write. That's pretty drunk. How many times have you been too drunk to think or write? Now imagine sitting in a final exam like that. But no problem here. So at one of the finals, I was too drunk to think or write. Though my drinking was not yet continuous, it disturbed my wife. Now his drinking has become problematic. Not a problem for him. It's a problem for Lois. You got a problem. No, I don't. You got a problem with me drinking. But that's not my problem. That's your problem. Okay? So what do we do? We have long talks. When I would steal her forebodings by telling her that men of genius conceive their best projects when drunk. That the most majestic constructions of philosophical thought were so derived. My version of that was... <coughs> I was a musician and a songwriter, and that's how I made my living. And I acquired a wife. I got married in a blackout. I don't recommend it, but it's a fact. So I'm a blackout drinker, and uh, I do, you know, I'm in a business that being over the top is considered an asset, not a liability. And I would get over the top, and uh, she would get uptight and, I would embarrass her or, or do something that was inappropriate or several things that were inappropriate. And, uh, and then I would sit down with her when I was sober and I was in the doghouse and we'd have the conversation. And my version of what Bill just did was, honey, you don't understand. I'm an artist. And I feel things so much more intensely and deeply than the average Joe. And once in a while... Carrying the burden of the entire planet on your soul, you need to take the edge off. Now, I will agree I went a little too far, but fear not, this won't happen again. That was my version of that. But it was all over my life, explaining unacceptable behavior, trying to make it acceptable. By the time I'd completed the course, I knew the law was not for me. Interesting. Goal, goal achieved, doesn't work. I'm going to speak to that. This idea of being externally referred. An alcoholic with a goal is like a baby with a machine gun. You give me a goal, I got a, I got a plan. Bill's plan, I'm going to create, I'm going to get this law degree and I'm going to be somebody and it's going to be cool. I'm going to be fine. My deal was I'm going to get a multi-record deal. I'm going to have a bunch of houses, a bunch of women, a bunch of money. And I'm going to be able to drink and do all the dope I want to do and thank you very much. doesn't matter. You get the goal. Here's the problem. Bill got the goal. We all have a picture of what our life is going to look like when we're okay. We all carry that picture. And every once in a while, you get the picture. Bill got the picture, got the law degree. And immediately, what did he come up with? The law is not for me. My idea would include a multi-record deal, a certain kind of truck, a guitar collection, a certain amount of dollars. Say, Let's say make $100,000 this year. Da, 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 right? And then I get the goal, I get the deal, and I get the hundred grand, I get the multi deal, I have everything that was in the picture. And immediately I go, son of a bitch, I'm not happy. I must need more money. You just rewrite the goal then. It never occurs to me, perhaps there's something wrong with you, Roger. Perhaps it's not the money that's going to make you happy. Perhaps it's not, there's no security in the money or the goals. Perhaps that's not what defines you. It doesn't occur to me to do that. It just, I must need a different woman. I must need a bigger woman, shorter woman, taller woman, blonder woman. I must need something different because this ain't working. That's why we drink and we go, this isn't working. So we try something else. Maybe we mix drugs with it. Maybe we just try a different brand of booze. But it's just at some point it stops working and we're looking for a solution. It never occurs to me to look inside and say, what's wrong with the way I'm looking at this? I'm always going, what's wrong with this? That's why I'm this way. And as long as that's my orientation, you'll be screwed in the ground the rest of your life, drunk or sober. Life is unacceptable because none of them behave properly. So, the inviting maelstrom of Wall Street had me in its grip. Business and financial leaders were my heroes. Out of this alloy of drink and speculation, I commenced to forge the weapon that one day would turn in its flight like a boomerang and all but cut me to ribbons. Living modestly, my wife and I saved a thousand bucks. This is in the 20s. This is a, a lot of dough. 
It went into certain securities then cheap and rather unpopular. I rightly imagined that they would someday have great rise. I failed to persuade my broker friends to send me out looking over factories and managements, but my life, wife and I decided to go anyway. Now, just for a little trivial pursuit for the next time you're sitting around trying to impress your friends about your recovery background knowledge, this little stock thing that Bill got into was Portland Cement. It was a new company on the West Coast, and he got in early, and he made it a bunch of money. So he's going to these Wall Street guys, and he's saying, you know, I got an idea, and they're going, Keep your idea, kid. So, take this. <laughs> so, he failed to persuade the broker friends to send me out looking over factories and managements. He wanted to do market research. But my wife and I decided to go anyway. How odd. I had developed a theory that most people lost money in stocks through ignorance of markets. I discovered many more reasons <laughs> later on. We gave up our positions and off we roared on a motorcycle. The sidecar stuff with tent and blankets, a change of clothes, and three huge volumes of financial reference service. Our friends thought a lunacy commission should be appointed. Perhaps they were right. I had some success at speculation, so we had a little money, but we once worked on a farm for a month to avoid drawing on our small capital. That was the last honest manual labor on my part for many a day. We covered the whole eastern United States in a year. At the end of it, my reports to Wall Street procured me a position there and the use of a large expense account. The exercise of an option Brought in more money, leaving us with a profit of several thousand dollars for that year. Dig this. Lois came from a privileged family. She was a debutante. She met Bill up in their vacation area in upper state New York. Lois grew up with servants and carriages. And her dad was a doctor. And you, you get the picture? Privileged, wealthy. She gets enamored with Bill, gets married to Bill, right? Bill is a wild ass. He's just... A drunk. He convinces his wife, this would have been a great series of conversations to listen to. Honey, I've got an idea. We're going to quit our jobs. Screw them. They don't know what they're talking about. I've bought a motorcycle, and we're going to get in it and ride around the country and analyze these industries. What do you think? <laughs> you know? Whatever, Bill. You know? <laughs> I mean, what a sales job. So they did it. And what Bill would do is he'd go, if they were, they were uh, researching a textile mill, he'd go get a job at the mill. And he'd get to know the employees on the inside to find out how the place was run and what the management was like and how things worked. So he came back, and he was right. He came back with a lot of information that nobody had. Worst thing that could happen to me is being right. I know how to deal with failure. But I have no idea how to deal with success. So Bill gets a large expense account. Hello. And a bunch of dough. So here we go. For the next few years, fortune threw money and applause my way. I had arrived. He got it. I got money, power, prestige. The picture is perfect. Thank you very much. I'm on. My judgment, my judgment, and my ideas were followed by the many to the tune of paper millions. The great boom of the late 20s was seething and swelling. Drink was taking an important and exhilarating part in my life. The effect. Alcohol is important. It has value. And the effect is it's exhilarating. He's already having an abnormal reaction. It doesn't exhilarate Lois. It puts her to sleep. There was loud talk in the jazz places uptown. Everyone spent in thousands and chattered in millions. Scoffers could scoff and be damned. I made a host of fair-weather friends. We all had fair-weather friends. You're my buddy if you got dope. You're my buddy if you got money. You're my buddy if you're buying. And I'm your buddy if the same is true of me. Hmm. My drinking assumed more serious proportions, continuing all day and almost every night. Sounds like it's progressing. I don't know. The remonstrances of my friends terminated in a row, and I became a lone wolf. <laughs> Frothy emotional appeal. Bill, can't you see what this, you know, we're relying on you. You got some big deals cooking. What do you, you know, screw you. Because I have my success to prove to bless you multiply. I have my success. I have my bank account, and I have my office in the corner window, and I have my expense account. Screw you. I know. I'm Bill. I know. So we end up, this is another one of the elements of alcoholism. We end up isolating. We end up being isolated 
by our illness. It's taking me, it's moving Bill away from the people that care about him and are, would indicate to him that he may have a problem and want to address it. And he's putting himself alone with himself. There were many unhappy scenes in our sumptuous apartment. There had been no real infidelity, so I guess there's something called unreal infidelity. I guess that would just be thinking. Um, for loyalty to my wife, my wife, helped at times by extreme drunkenness, kept me out of those scrapes. In 1929, I contracted golf fever. We went at once to the country, my wife to applaud while I started to overtake Walter Hagen. He was the Tiger Woods of the day. Okay? He was the supreme golfer on the planet Earth. So Bill's doing a geographic. Have you ever done that? Just change locations. Because I did it a lot. Um, you know, uh, Minneapolis was became problematic for me. I got in some trouble. And uh, I couldn't work in this town. And uh, I knew an agent in Denver. And I thought, yeah, Colorado. Mountains. That's me. Yeah, I'll go to Colorado. So I went to Colorado because of the closed mind of Minnesotans. I thought, yeah, the Wild West. Open-minded people, you know, seat your pants, let it rip. I like this. I got out there and all went well for a while. But if you've done this, you know that wherever you go, there you are. I brought me with me. That was the problem. I thought the problem was Minneapolis. I got to Denver and in a little over a year, I had created Minneapolis again. I thought, God damn, I had no idea these cowboys were going to be so narrow-minded. You know, and on and on. It just never occurs to us to look inside. What's the common thread in your inventory? When you look at your sex conduct inventory and the harms done to other people, the only commonality is you. I was there for all of it. I was there for everything. Me. I'm the thread that runs through it all. So, huh. So now he's taking a geographic. They moved to the country. Liquor caught up with me much faster than I came up behind Walter. I began to be jittery in the morning. Now, he's become a round-the-clock drinker, drinking morning, noon, and night. Now he's out in the country. I mean, that's a good conversation, honey. This city is it's just too much pressure, too much stress here. Let's move to the country. I'll commute on the train. It'll be fine, and, and we'll, we'll be happy again. Okay. So they get out there, and Bill recreates the same mess. So, now he's got the morning shakes, easily addressed with a shot or two of whiskey. But golf permitted drinking every day and every night. It was fun to carry him around the exclusive course, which had inspired awe in me as a lad. I acquired the impeccable coat of tan one sees upon the well-to-do. The local banker watched me whirl fat checks in and out of his till with amused skepticism. So, this is kind of Bill's triumphant return. This is a place that he had seen as a kid, but he wasn't allowed to be on because it was for people of means. And now Bill's on the course. <laughs> nice metaphor. I, in, I acquired the impeccable coat of tan one sees upon the well-to-do. I look like I'm well-to-do. I've got the facade in place. I look like it's happening. I look like I understand how this works. But inside, I am clueless. The banker is hip to this because he's watching me be a big deal and he's... Amused skepticism is how he describes it. Banker's not being fooled. Abruptly, in October of 29, hell broke loose on the New York Stock Exchange. After one of those days of inferno, I wobbled from a hotel bar to a brokerage office. It was 8 o'clock. Five hours after the market closed, the ticker still clattered. I was staring at an inch of tape which bore the inscription XYZ-32. It had been 52 that morning. I was finished, and so were many friends. The papers reported men jumping to death from the towers of high finance. That disgusted me. I wouldn't jump. I went back to the bar. <laughs> My friends had dropped several million since 10 o'clock. So what? Tomorrow's another day. As I drank, the old fierce determination to win came back. Dig this. In this paragraph, big market crash, global economy in the toilet. Where is Bill? He's in the bar. He goes from the bar to the office, sees everything's gone to hell. His solution to that is, well, I'm going back to the bar, <laughs> you know. And the arrogance of it. I mean, the entire economy of the earth collapsed. And Bill said, well, tomorrow's another day. <laughs> what the hell, you know. But here's the effect. As I drank, the old 
fierce determination to win came back. That's the effect alcohol has on Bill. In full face of the facts. Next morning, I telephoned a friend in Montreal. This is my Colorado call. He had plenty of money left, and I thought, better go to Canada. By the following spring, we were living in our custom style. I felt like Napoleon returning from Elba. No St. Helena for me. But drinking caught up with me again, and my generous friend had to let me go. This time, we stayed broke. So Bill got the picture back, went to Canada, reestablished himself there. Got it all right. But the problem is... He's developed this relationship with ethyl alcohol that's running his life. And he couldn't hold on to what he had because he had to drink. So the guy dismissed him. This time we stayed broke. You see, there's kind of a downward spiral going on here. Things are getting bad, bad to worse, bad to worse. We went to live with my wife's parents. <laughs> that's not a big shot. I found a job, then lost it as a result of a bar with a brawl with a taxi driver. Mercifully, no one could guess that I was to have no real employment for five years or hardly draw a sober breath. My wife began to work in the department store, coming home exhausted to find me drunk. One of the definitions of a functioning alcoholic is an alcoholic who has a wife who works. Bill has now gone from being this magnificent, genius of the street to being home drunk in his robe while his wife the debutante is out working in a department store I became an an unwelcome hanger on at brokerage places now Bill has an awareness liquor ceased to be a luxury it became a necessity that's an aha that's a moment of clarity that's an awakening That's a moment of truth. Liquor ceased to be a luxury. It became a necessity. Can't live without it. Oxygen is a necessity. Food is a necessity. Sleep is a necessity. Liquor has become a necessity. Bathtub gin. Two bottles a day, often three, got to be routine. Sometimes a small deal would net a few hundred dollars. I'd pay my bills at the bars and delis. Notice he didn't say I'd go, Oh, Lois, look at honey. I made some dough. Why don't you pay off some of those back bills? He went and paid off his dealer. Paid off my tab. Because he knew he was going to need it again. You want to be right with your bartender. You want to be right with your bartender, your dealer, whatever. You know. This went on endlessly. And I began to waken very early in the morning, shaking violently. Anyone had the morning shakes? That's just, you're going into withdrawal. DTs. Your body's saying, give us some alcohol right now or we're going to shake you apart. So, a tumbler full of gin. I like this image. A tumbler full of gin followed by a six-pack would be required if I were to eat any breakfast. That was breakfast, wasn't it? Eat any breakfast. Nevertheless, I still thought I could control the situation. The delusion of the alcoholic. Look at the condition of his life. He's unemployable. He can't stop drinking. Nevertheless, what? The idea. I still thought. I have this idea that says, you know what? I know it looks bad, but we think you can control this, Bill. We think you can control it. Huh. There were periods of sobriety which renewed my wife's hope. Didn't say it renewed his hopes. Gradually, things got worse. (laughs) No kidding. The house was taken over by the mortgage holder. My mother-in-law died. My wife and the father-in-law became ill. Wow. Then I got a promising business opportunity. Stocks were at the low point of 1932. So they've been in this hole for three years. And I had somehow formed a group to buy. This must have been a precious group if Bill was leading it. Holy moly. Think about that. I was to share generously in the profits. Oh, what a surprise. Then I went on a prodigious bender, and the chance vanished. That's exactly what we read in the doctor's opinion. He said, what about when you were celebrating? What about when you weren't drinking to escape, but you were just drinking to overcome this phenomenon of craving? Everything was going fine. Bill just said, damn, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. This is going to be great. Took a drink, blew it. Blew it. I woke up. 
Another awakening. This had to be stopped. I saw I could not take so much as one drink. I was through forever. Before then, I'd written lots of sweet promises, but my wife happily observed that this time I meant business, and so I did. So, liquor ceased to be luxury, became a necessity. I woke up and said to stop. I see that I can't even take a single drink. So, Bill's got the information now. I can't drink. And I don't want to. There's a lot of people in this room that want to. They don't want to accept that they can't drink. Because it's the only thing they got going. I can't drink. I don't like that idea. Okay, well then go drink. But this is a guy who wants to stop, has resolved to stop, and can't stop. But he has no reference point. So he, he can't sit around and go, God, <coughs> it appears I have no power. He thinks he's got power. He's got a whole history that says he can make things happen. So I did shortly after I came home drunk. Damn! There had been no fight. Where had been my high resolve? I simply didn't know. I hadn't even, it hadn't even come to mind. Someone had pushed a drink my way. I'd taken it. Was I crazy? I began to wonder. For such an appalling lack of perspective, that's a nice pocket definition of insanity, seemed near being just that. Renewing my resolve. You see, he keeps going back to the well, which is self-reliance. And he doesn't realize that he doesn't have anything reliable to go back to. He's got no power. I tried again. Some time passed, and confidence began to be replaced by cocksuredness. I could laugh at the gin mills. Now I had what it takes. So now he's got the experience of the intoxication of success. One day I walked into a cafe to telephone. In no time, I was beating on the bar, asking myself how it happened. As the whiskey rose to my head, I told myself I'd manage better next time, but I might as well get good and drunk. And I did. Interesting. Bill has to make a phone call. He chooses a bar. I'm sure there were payphones somewhere else. Just a coincidence. I made a call in a bar, and I ended up in the bar. The remorse, horror, and the hopelessness of the next morning are unforgettable. The courage to do battle was not there. Now, it sounds like Bill has surrendered. It sounds like a bottom, doesn't it? So does luxury cease to, <coughs> liquor cease to be a necessity became a luxury. I woke up to said to be stopped. I saw I couldn't see, take so much as a single drink. Those all sound like bottoms. Now, remorse, horror, and hopelessness of the next morning are unforgettable, are they? My brain raced uncontrollably, and there was a terrible sense of impending calamity. I hardly dare cross the street, lest I collapse and be run down by an early morning truck. Oh, he was out drinking all night. <laughs> For it was scarcely daylight. An all-night place supplied me with a dozen glasses of ale. My writhing nerves were stilled at last. A morning paper told me the market had gone to hell again. <clears throat> well, so had I. The market would recover, but I wouldn't. That was a hard thought. Should I kill myself? No, not now. Then a mental fog settled down. Gin would fix that. So two bottles and oblivion. Bill's only option now is suicide. It's starting to occur to him. I would be really surprised. I'm not going to poll you, but I would be really surprised if everyone in this room hasn't thought about killing themselves. Because the alternative is to go on living the way I'm living, and that's unacceptable. And I can't stop drinking, so the only thing I can do is stop living. The mind and body are marvelous mechanisms, for mine endured this agony two more years. God. Sometimes I stole from my wife's slender purse when the morning terror and madness were on me. Again, I swayed dizzily before an open window or the medicine cabinet where there was poison, cursing myself for a weakling. There were flights from the city to the country and back as my wife and I sought escape. Then came the night when the physical and mental torture was so hellish I feared I would burst through my window, sash and all. Somehow I managed to drag my mattress to a lower floor lest I suddenly leap. Look at in the same paragraph, he's saying, I'm cursing myself because I'm a wimp and I won't kill myself. By the end of the day, he's afraid he's going to kill himself and he drags his mattress downstairs. That's insanity. Bill is, mind is out of control. A doctor came with a heavy sedative. Thank you. Next day, found me drinking both gin and sedative. Of course. <laughs> what did you think? This combination soon landed me on the rocks. People feared for my sanity. So did I. 
I could eat little or nothing when drinking. I was 40 pounds underweight. My brother-in-law is a physician. This is Leonard Strong, who became one of our uh, first trustees. And through his kindness and that of my mother, I was placed in a nationally known hospital for the mental and physical rehabilitation of alcoholics. This is Towns Hospital with Silkworth. Under the so-called belladonna treatment, my brain cleared. Does anyone know what belladonna is? Belladonna is a nasty drug. I was introduced to belladonna by a stripper named Saturday. And uh, belladonna is a powder. And when you use it the way you're supposed to use it, you put it in it's a treatment. One of the things is a treatment for asthma. And you put it in boiling water, and you put a towel over your head, and you breathe the vapors, and it opens, opens your airways up. Well, if you take it, it's a hallucinogen if you eat it. And uh, so this is what they use to clear Bill's brain. We've got to give you a little trip here, Billy, and straighten you out here. We're going to get your reset back to zero. A little hot tub, a little hydrotherapy, and some mild exercise. <coughs> Best of all, I met a doctor, who, this is Silkworth, who explained, though certainly selfish and foolish, I'd been seriously ill bodily and mentally. New idea. It relieved me somewhat to learn that in alcoholics, the will is amazingly weakened when it comes to combating liquor, though it often remains strong in other respects. My incredible behavior in the face of a desperate desire to stop was explained. Understanding myself now, I fared forth in high hope. For three or four months, the goose hung high. I went to town regularly, even made a little money. Surely this was the answer, self-knowledge. So his first treatment... Silky gives him this idea. You're bodily and mentally different, Bill. You got this allergic thing. You got this mind that keeps leading you back to the drink. That's the problem. Bill goes, thank you. Information. Self-knowledge. Knowledge about me. I will apply that in knowledge, and that problem will go away. But Bill doesn't have the power to apply the knowledge. So, surely this was the answer, self-knowledge. But it wasn't, for the frightful day came when I drank once more. The curve of my declining moral and bodily health fell off like a ski jump. After a time, I returned to the hospital. Second trip. This was the finish, the curtain, it seemed to me. My weary and despairing wife was informed that it would all end with heart failure during delirium tremens, which is withdrawal, or I would develop a wet brain, perhaps within a year. She would soon have to give me over to the undertaker or the asylum. So Bill's in his second detox, and he's hearing Silkworth talk to his wife, and he's saying, hope less. I see guys like this all the time. Lois, he's either going to die shaking it out, or he's going to end up up in the psych ward in a diaper. They didn't need to tell me. I knew and almost welcomed the idea. It was a devastating blow to my pride, my ego. I, who had thought so well of myself and my abilities, of my capacity to surmount obstacles, was cornered at last. Now I was to plunge into the dark, joining the endless procession of sots who had gone on before. I thought of my poor wife. There had been much happiness, after all. What would I not give to make amends? But that was over now. No words can tell of the loneliness and despair I found in the bitter morass of self-pity. Quicksand stretched around me in all directions. I had met my match. I had been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. This sounds like a bottom... This sounds like almost an awakening. Bill's saying, it's a nice metaphor, quicksand stretch around me in all directions. <coughs> Bill's going, everywhere I look, the options I have are unacceptable. I'm out of bullets. I'm out of ideas. So, now Bill's got two pieces to his program. He's got the information about the body and the mind that he got in the first treatment. And now he's coupled that with what he got out of the second treatment, which was fear. I'm going to die. There's not a person in here that can be scared sober. We all have had consequences, some great, some small, but we all have consequences. You cannot scare someone sober. You cannot say you've got six months to live, because I'll be thinking, well, okay, I'll drink five months, 29 days, you know, 23 hours, 59 minutes, 59 seconds, you know, I'll give it up right at the end. It just, you can't do it. I've sat in I've sat in court with drunks, and the doc said, well, look, you can either get some help for your drinking problem, or you can go to jail for a year. And they'll turn around and look at me and go, what should I do? <laughs> you know? 
they're going to give us they're going to give us a couple of experiments to run here in 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 a while in the book and the AA says you need to self-diagnose yourself and the way you do that is you try some controlled drinking stop and start stop and start right when it's kicking in stop leave do that more than once or try some controlled sobriety try not drinking for a year run those two experiments so you get full knowledge of your condition your experience <coughs> So, trembling, I bet, I stepped from the hospital a broken man. Fear sobered me for a bit. Then came the insidious insanity of the first drink. And on Armistice Day, 1934, I was off again. Everyone became resigned to the certainty that I would have to be shut up somewhere or would stumble along to a miserable end. How dark it is before the dawn. In reality... That was the beginning of my last debauch. I was soon to be catapulted into what I like to call the fourth dimension of existence. I was to know happiness, peace, and usefulness in a way of life that is incredibly more wonderful as time passes. Interesting he slipped that in there because it doesn't seem to fit with the rest of what we're reading. I think he was wondering, God, this is so depressing. I better tell them before they shut the book that it turns out okay because it's it doesn't fit. So he's out here in the, the second treatment drink. Near the end of the bleak November, I sat drinking in my kitchen. With a certain satisfaction, I reflected there was enough gin concealed about the house to carry me through that night and the next day. My wife was at work. I wondered whether I dared hide a full bottle of gin near the head of the bed. I would need it before daylight. Now, this is Bill. This is the guy who imagined himself a leader of vast enterprises. This was a guy who was incredibly successful in Wall Street. This was a guy who'd been the man. Now, the biggest concern of the day is, do I have enough booze to get through the day? Now I got a problem. My problem is I may have to hide some near my pillow. I wonder if Lois will catch me. I mean, it's like, that's a long ways from where Bill started. My musing was interrupted by the telephone. Cheery voice of an old school friend asked if he might come over. This is Ebby. He was sober. It was years since I could remember his coming to New York in that condition. I was amazed. Rumor had it that he'd been committed for alcoholic insanity. I wondered how he'd escaped. Of course he wondered how he escaped, because he couldn't imagine him being sober. Um, a little background on Ebby. Ebby was hanging out in Upper State New York. His dad was a judge, was a <laughs> vice presidential candidate one time, considered for. His family was very well connected. And he knew Lois socially, and they met Bill, because Bill was up there working his summers up there. He wasn't as well-to-do. But they all had met in their late teens. They all knew each other. And this circle came back together. Um, Roland Hassert, the guy that uh, ended up studying with Carl Jung, came back and got in a thing called the Oxford Group. The Oxford Group split into two groups called Moral Rearmament, and the other group is Up With People. Imagine that. The Oxford group's principles were not about, had anything to do with temperance. The deal was, we are here to win souls over for Christ. Period. Okay? So you win the man, the man wins his friend, you win the town, you win the state, you win the country. Frank Buckman was the head of that deal, and he screwed up because he went over to Europe, and there were some pictures of him glad-handing Adolf Hitler. And he was trying to convince Hitler to change his ways. But what it looked like is they were endorsing him. But another thing. Anyway, so Roland knew Ebby's family. And Ebby was up. He was going to get committed. He was going to jail for drinking. And uh, he, had a little, he had a lot of problems with drinking. But the, the thing that broke the, the camel's back, he was up painting the house at the estate. He, You know how we are. I think I'll paint the house. And then you paint about 12 feet and you sit back and look at it and have a few more drinks and paint another few feet. Anyway, he'd gotten the side of the house painted, and the birds were screwing with it. So he went and got his shotgun. And he stood out in the neighborhood, and he was blasting away at these birds in the trees, and the cops came and got him. So they were going to put him away. And Roland knew the judge, and Roland said, give him to us, put him in our custody. We got something we think will work for him. Because Roland had gone to Jung and found out about the power thing, come back and fell into the Oxford group. So the circle is an interesting one here, and how Jung and Silkworth and Roland and Ebby and Bill and Lois, all these guys 
were going in and out of each other's lives for years. So <laughs> Roland took Abby to the Oscar group, and Abby got sober. He'd been sober, I think, a couple, three months when he went to talk to Bill. And part of their deal was proselytizing. So Abby is going to his friend who's drinking. That's why Bill is so amazed, because the only reference he has to Abby is Abby is one of the guys that drank like him. You remember the doctor was talking about weight and experience? If you're going to meet someone and you're going to have this experience, they're going to need to have weight and depth to what they're saying. Now, Abby is like a frickin' ghost, because he shows up. It was years since I'd seen him. Remember coming to New York? Rumor had it that he'd been committed for alcoholic sanity. wonder how I escaped. Of course, we'd have dinner. Then I would drink openly with him. Unmindful of his welfare, I thought only of recapturing the spirit of other days. There was that time we'd chartered an airplane to complete a jag. His coming was an oasis in this dreary desert of futility. The very thing, an oasis. Drinkers are like that. The door opened and there he stood, fresh-skinned and glowing. There was something about his eyes. He was inexplicably different. What had happened? That sounds like Silkworth describing that guy who came back to him. Couldn't even recognize him. I pushed a drink across the table. He refused it. Disappointed but curious, I wondered what had gone into the fellow. He wasn't himself. And I would have added to that, well, more for me. <laughs> but, come, what's this all about, I queried. He looked straight at me. Simple. But smilingly, he said, I've got religion. I was aghast. This is a visit that's going south really fast. <laughs> so that was it. Last summer, an alcoholic crackpot. Now I suspect a little cracked about religion. He had that starry-eyed look. Yeah, the old boy was on fire, all right. But bless his heart, let him rant. Besides, my gin would last longer than his preaching. But he did no ranting. In a matter-of-fact way, he told how two men had appeared in court persuading the judge to suspend his commitment. They had told of a simple religious idea and a practical program of action. That was two months ago. And the result was self-evident. It worked. And their basic deal was... was um, surrender your life to God, confessions of sins, restitution, and then go out and uh, get some people, do some 12-step work, go win some lives over for Christ. He had come to pass his experience along to me if I cared to have it. I was shocked, but interested. Certainly I was interested. I had to be, for I was hopeless. So Bill has attained <coughs> a certain degree of open-mindedness, even though the experience he's having with Ebby is not pleasant. But he's still willing to admit to himself, well, look at Jocko. You don't have anything going for yourself. Maybe you ought to give Ebby a listen while he's drinking. While he's drinking. He talked for hours. Childhood mem memories rose before me. I could almost hear the sound of the preacher's voice as I sat on the still Sundays way over there on the hillside. There was that pro-offered temperance pledge I never signed, my grandfather's good-natured contempt of church folk and their doings, his insistence that the spheres really had their music, but his denial that the preacher's right to tell him how he must listen, his fearlessness as he spoke of these things just before he died. These recollections welled up from the past. They made me swallow hard. That wartime day in old Winchester Cathedral came back again. I'd always believed in a power greater than myself. I had often pondered these things. I was not an atheist. Few people really are, for that means blind faith in the strange proposition that this universe originated in a cipher and aimlessly rushes nowhere. My intellectual heroes, the chemists, the astronomers, even the evolutionists, suggested vast laws and forces at work. Despite contrary indications, I had little doubt that a mighty purpose and rhythm underlay all. How could there be so much of precise and immutable law and no intelligence? I simply had to believe in the spirit of the universe who knew neither time nor limitation. But that was as far as I'd gone. So Bill has given us a piece of information. He believes in something. He believes in a power greater than himself. But what he's demonstrated is he has no relationship to or with it. Nice idea. I keep it over here, but it doesn't apply to me. It doesn't apply to me and Lois. It doesn't apply to me and... Other women doesn't apply to me in drinking, doesn't apply to me in work, doesn't apply to me in anything, but I've got this belief, which is totally useless because you don't employ it. So that's his situation. My situation was I was an atheist. 
I was an evangelical atheist. I wanted you all to be atheists with me. Some people believe, some people don't believe. All you got, what's important here is to get in front of what do I believe? Because that's your starting point. That's where you have to begin. When, with the ministers in the world's religions, I parted right there. When they talked to God personal to me, who was love, superhuman strength, and direction, I became irritated and my mind snapped shut against such a theory. Bill didn't like being told how to believe or what to believe. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Right? So he's giving you his objections. To Christ I conceded the certainty of a great man not too closely followed by those who claimed him. His moral teachings are most excellent. For myself, I had adopted those parts which seemed convenient and not too difficult. The rest I disregarded. Which is exactly how I did the steps. I did the first step. That was my program. The rest I disregarded. Didn't apply to me. Wasn't going to do it. Wasn't going to pretend I was going to do it. Wasn't going to talk about getting ready to do it. I just said, screw it. I ain't doing it. Because I don't believe in God. And this is all about God, obviously. So I'm not doing it. The wars which had been fought, the burnings and chicanery that religious disputed facilitated made me sick. I honestly doubted whether on balance the religions of mankind had done any good. Judging from what I'd seen in Europe and since, the power of God in human affairs was negligible. The brother had a man of grim jest. If there was a devil, he seemed to be the boss universally, and he certainly had me. Good argument. That's a great argument against the existence of God. If there's a God, why is there so much misery in the world? More people have been killed in the name of God on the planet Earth than anything else. Got Judaism, got Christianity, got Islam. They all believe in the same God. They got three different prophets, and they've been killing each other for thousands of years over it. This is what we consider the last final revelation, revel, revel, revelation of God, God's word. No, we're not, because we went and we started late. I'll finish in just a second. You got a. When's your next meeting? Okay. All right. From when to when? 10 to 11. 10 to 11. Who's got a 40-minute chore? You can leave. <laughs> I just want to finish the point, and I'll let you out of here. So the question is, what are my arguments? That's what we want to get in front of. What are your arguments about the power idea? That's the seed here. What do you believe? And why? what is your argument about why you don't want to believe or don't have to believe? Good questions to start chewing on. But my friend sat before me and he made the point blank declaration that God had done for him what he couldn't do for himself. His human will had failed. Doctors had pronounced him incurable. Now Bill's doing a little checklist. Me too, me too. Society was about to lock him up. Like myself, he admitted complete defeat. Then he had in effect been raised from the dead, <coughs> suddenly taken from the scrap heap to a level of life better than the best he'd ever known. Had this power originated in him? Obviously it had not. There had been no more power in him than there was in me at that minute, and this was none at all. That floored me. Ebby's example is more powerful than Bill's argument. He's going, yeah, this is what I believe, but God, here's Ebby. How do I explain that? And Ebby says, it's God, man. It's God. Oh, shit. That's not good news. It began to look as though religious people were right after all. Here was something that worked in a human heart which had done the impossible. My ideas about miracles were drastically revised right then. Never mind the musty past. Here sat a miracle directly across the table. He shouted great tidings. I saw that my friend was much more than inwardly reorganized. He was on different footing. His roots grasped a new soil. Nice metaphor. The root is what feeds the plant. Your ideas, your beliefs, your concepts are what form your consciousness, and that's what feeds you. So if your root is resentment and fear and self-centeredness, that's what you're going to grow. That's what your little bush is going to be. It's going to be all those things. That's what the fruit of your thinking is going to be. So, despite the living example of my friend, there remain in me the vestiges of my old prejudice. <laughs> despite the miracle I just described. Just a second. Despite the miracle I just described, I'm still a little skeptical. Because I know in my gut, 
I'm not willing to do what Ebby appears to be doing. The word God still aroused a certain antipathy, a bad feeling. When the thought was expressed there might be a God personal to me, this feeling was intensified. I didn't like the idea. And this book is all about your ideas. What ideas upset you? What ideas are you attracted to? What ideas inform your behavior? I could go for such conceptions as creative intelligence, universal mind, or spirit of nature, but I resisted the thought of a czar of the heavens, however loving his sway might be. I have since talked with scores of men who felt the same way. My friend suggested what then seemed a novel idea, and it was a novel idea. He said, why don't you choose your own conception of God? And then we move on. Statement hit me hard. Right. But understand this. Ebby was not a religious guy. Ebby was not well-educated, and he certainly wasn't well-read. He got sober in the Oxford group, whose whole thing was winning lives over for Christ. And he says to Bill, after talking to him for hours, why don't you choose your own conception of God? That's the way Bill says it. When you listen to Ebby, I got a radio interview of Ebby talking about this. He said, I finally said, the hell with him. Choose your own conception of God. And I got up from the table and I left. Doesn't matter how it was delivered, the idea has saved millions of lives. Because if I can choose my own conception, that means you, my pastor, my priest, my rabbi, nobody is going to define that but me. There is an enormous freedom in that. It just took away a ton of argument. A ton of argument. You can choose your own conception. AA says that. Your religion does not say that. I'm not knocking religion. I'm just saying if you're a person in the room that has deep religious beliefs... It's going to seem like this is a contradiction. But what I will report to you is that your religion will come alive as your recovery does. Because you'll have a different relationship. You don't have to dump your religion if you got it. But what you have to realize is your religion, this is, I mean, you get this sponsoring ministers and priests. They're sitting with you there in the pulpit. <coughs> and they don't believe what they're saying. Because they don't have an experience of God. So we get to choose our own conception. AA says, choose your own conception. That's part of the tenet of what we're working with. So I don't have to believe what you believe. I don't have to believe what he believes. No. And your conception will form as you go through the exercises. Your conception will form as you go through the exercises. Uh, we'll continue Wednesday. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Whoever had the question, we can talk now.